Welcome to Beyond the Arc. I'm John Gonzalez alongside in our Florida HQ studios, Ashley Nicole Moss, and playing the role of our NBA insider today in the absence of Bill Ryder, Chris Walker is back on the program. What's up, gang? Hey, hey, hey. Ashley, be nice today. Be Listen, nice today. The Knicks, the Knicks have been chilling. The Lakers have been chilling. Well, relatively speaking, I, I'm cool. I'm cool as a cucumber today. Uh, I am not. Can I just say that right before we came on air, I found out, I already knew that Ashley was a Cowboys fan, and then Chris informs me that he's also a Cowboys fan. So now I am bookended by Cowboys fans. So I'm doing this show under protest. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. This feels like Listen, I, I got to take this for, up with HR. Luckily for you, you don't do a football podcast. This is the basketball one. Yeah, that's true. Thank God. That's You know what? That's, that's the last thing we'll say about the Cowboys on today's program. All right, later in the show, <laughs> we're going to discuss Joe Missoula's unique coaching style, and we'll have the latest on the Lakers coaching search drama. But first, gang, Game three last night, Celtics take it, 106-99, they're up 3-0. They're up 21 with 11 minutes left. And then they gave away 20 of those points. The Mavs cut it to one, but the Celtics found a way. They held on, and now they are one W away from their 18th championship. That would be the most in NBA history. Here's something else. There's only ever been nine sweeps in NBA history, and just two since LeBron entered the league. And it looks like we might be headed for number 10. Ash, I'll start with you. Is it already over? Oh, yeah, for time? sure. Um, I don't yeah. know if I'm going to go as far as saying a sweep. I do think it's hard to close out games. We've seen that time and time again. And I will say that it has the possibility to go five, not because I think the Mavs are going to do anything miraculous. But as I said, it's hard to close out games. So I wouldn't be surprised if the Celtics were to give one up um, in a closeout game. And also if the Mavs, relatively speaking, played well on their home court. But Ultimately, whether it's four, whether it's five, this series is over. And it's not because I don't think the Dallas Mavericks are a good team. It's because they haven't been playing like the team that we have seen throughout the regular season, especially the second half of the regular season. And also not like the team that we have seen throughout this postseason, whether it's that Clippers team, whether that it's that Timberwolves series that we were all so highly impressed by. They look like a drastically different Mavericks team. And it's one thing to face a team that's, more complete than you and better equipped in this series than you are. And that's what the Celtics are. It's one thing to just not compete. And it's walking the borderline of them, them simply not competing in one way, shape or form. It's just an abysmal, abysmal performance in the finals from the Dallas Mavericks. Yeah, it really has been. I mean, and we're going to get into Luka and his whole defensive issues. Kyrie finally showed up. We're going to get into the Mavericks. But for the Celtics component, Chris, they have looked so good every time it looks like the Mavs might have a way to counter the Boston Celtics the Boston Celtics go no 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 no. we're too deep we have too many guys we're going to figure this out last night there were a couple of moments where I was like oh it's over when Xavier Tillman hit a three ball Jalen Brown had a poster <laughs> dunk that was another moment what for you when did you go yeah this is over you know you know what's funny first of all that graphic shout out to our production friend put Bailey Howell who the heck is Bailey Howell Two thirty point game. That is tremendous, that little nugget right there. You know, I was flying back from Orlando from the NBA Players Camp, and I was watching the game on a plane, and I'm going to be embarrassed to say when they went up 21, I'm, and I don't sleep on planes, I probably nodded off for a second, and all of a sudden, you know, the, the thunderous comeback by the Mavs. But I'll tell you this. For me, the one thing, all the adjectives that you mentioned to describe the Celtics, the one that's left out is connected connected those guys are connected and i know we'll talk about jason tatum and and jalen brown and and then and then the the porzingis situation where he did not play and joe Missoula and his wizardry and how he's brought this team together you know under dire circumstances where people thinking he was unfit for the job the one thing they do well and we'll talk about this daryl morey brought it to the league and ashley may disagree the three-point shot they don't post up at all, do not throw it in the post, and they shoot threes the entire game. And back in the day, everyone would think that is ridiculous basketball or that's running up and down, as my old coach, Roland Massimino, would say, chuck and duck. But it's proved to be the difference. They shoot so many threes. And the last thing I'll say is it was never the Mavs that were supposed to play the Celtics anyway. They're not the most yeah. complete team to play. I think they're overmatched, even though they have two superstars who actually, who loves Kyrie Irving, might have said when somebody, I don't know if she agreed or not, was the best backcourt in NBA history, I dare not say, and it's being proved right now. 
I didn't say that. <laughs> you agreed, I think. I think you agreed, Ash. Come on now. I it, said it was no. S I people it was were SVG, yeah. There people were saying it and I said I wouldn't disagree. I don't know if I'd put them in the top. I put them maybe just based on the way they were playing in the postseason, I wouldn't be far fetched to say top three, but to be the top you have to win and they haven't won a championship. When you talk about the top you can talk about Steph and Clay. You can talk about Magic and Byron Scott. I mean, there's lists, but there's something that all those guys have in common. They have one championship. So I didn't say that. Stan SVG said that. Don't put that on me, Chris Walker. Okay, I have enough going on. Uh, amazing. <laughs> you guys are you, you guys are off and running. Chris, you mentioned the the three point shooting. I mean, 100. percent The Celtics love to fire away, play five out. They sh they put up 46 last night. And the Mavs. I mentioned this on HQ last night. As you can see, I'm in a hotel room here in Stanford, Connecticut. Does nobody on the Mavericks have a calculator or an abacus or something? Because the, the, the Celtics are putting up 46 threes and the Mavs only took 25. And I'm like, you're not going to beat all those threes with just a whole bunch of twos. It doesn't work that way. But you also mentioned, and we got to get into this, the, the two Jays, Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown. And after the game, both of them were good last night. Jason Tatum finally showed up offensively. After the game, Jason Tatum was on the podium. And he was getting asked a lot of questions. And somebody took a kind of a timeout and said, I'm going to ask you a question that's not really about basketball, but it ended up kind of being about basketball as it relates to Jason Tatum. Here's what he said, it was interesting. Father's Day is coming up on Sunday and I know that's something that's very important to you. As you begin to face this obstacle of fighting for a title, what would you tell your son about facing obstacles and overcoming them? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I would say that, you know, life is, is about roller coasters, right? And, uh, the game of basketball and, and life and whatever your occupation is, right? We all go through ups and downs. Uh, and in the toughest moments, uh, that's when your true character comes out. Uh, and essentially being the same person all the time, that's what uh, I try to do um, in the best of times and in the worst of times. And um, that's what I'm gonna try to instill him that uh, you, you gotta be the same person, gotta be a stand-up guy, uh, you know, through thick and thin. Ash, I like that answer from him. I thought it was thoughtful. It struck me last night that, you know, obviously he's trying to give advice to his son, but he's talking about himself too, right? I mean, his life has been a roller coaster recently. We've spent a lot of time on this show. A lot of people who have shows and talk about basketball for a living have talked about whose team it is. I thought he's handled it all pretty well. I also think that conversation is fluid, right? Because I think it changes from season to season. I think it changes, you know, depending on series to series, right? I think that in this particular postseason, I think you can go ahead and say this team belongs, and I put that in air quotes, to Jalen Brown. And it has nothing to do with him being better statistically or more aggressive when it comes to scoring because there are multiple ways to affect the outcome of the game, right? And in game one, it was the Porzingis game. In game two, it was the Drew Holiday game. But Jason Tatum had a hand in helping those wins. It just wasn't in terms of scoring baskets, right? But I think that when we talk about whose team it is, at some point of the season, it could be Jalen Brown's. At some point, it could be Jason Tatum's. And, you know, there are other names that you can throw in there. But usually it goes back and forth between those guys. But for me, I say that it's Jalen Brown's team, at least this particular postseason, not because I think he's a better scorer, a better rebounder, a better defender, or whatever. It's not in that comparison. It's because he's more vocal. I feel like we have seen a more vocal Jalen Brown when he's mic'd up. You can hear the way he speaks to his teammates. You can hear the way he uplifts them or, you know, lights a fire under them. And Jason Tatum is not that guy, and that's okay. That's not – it's never really been his character. You've never really seen him get fired up like that the way that we have seen Jalen Brown throughout this postseason. So when people throw it around whose team it is and who's a leader, I feel like that's a little – I feel like it's an unfair argument because you're asking a player to be different than who he is. I think it's fair to say you want to see Jason Tatum be more aggressive. You got that last night. No Porzingis. He had to step up. That's what he did. But the conversation about whose team it is, I feel isn't as cut and dry and black and white as people have made it seem. And I wish like that conversation would just stop. I understand, you know, it's engagement and things like that. But I think it's an unfair conversation because it changes from year to year. You know what's interesting? When people make comments like that, I say they aren't basketball people when they talk like that. Never coached, never played. You know, I don't care who it is. No disrespect. The Celtics are up 3 0, and we're talking about whose team it is. Now, I might add, Jason Tatum leaves them in scoring points, right? Leaves them in assists and rebounds for the playoffs. 
It's not like he's struggling miserably here. He's just not scoring at the same efficiency that he we're accustomed to seeing him score. Because if he did that, it would be no question who the MVP is. He leads him in points. He leads him in scoring. I'm sorry. Yes, he does. Look at look at the average. Look at the average. He leads him in scoring average, rebounds, and assists. So no, what are we talking about? no, no, no. I, I'm not disagreeing with you there, but I don't know if that makes it easy to determine who the MVP is. I don't think, I think the MVP, for me at least, when you talk about that award, when you talk about finals MVP, it's more than just who statistically is leading in points, rebounds, assists. I think you have to look at the overall landscape of the playoffs, which for me is why it's Jalen Brown and it's not Jason Tatum. Probably going to be Jalen. Well, let me just Jaylen. say this. Take Jason Tatum off the team and watch what happens. Because he's well, doing other that's... things. Mm. that are not showing up, that are not showing up, because all we think about and focus on is scoring. I, LeBron gets the same headache, I'm telling you. Oh, well, he's not doing this. Kyrie made the shot. But Jalen Brown's not, doing Kyrie more. Be the MVP. JB's well, doing way is, more than scoring, though. I understand that, but Tatum, again, I, I mentioned before, I preface by saying he leaves him in scoring average, mm -hmm. he leaves him in rebounds, and he leaves him in assists. So what are we talking about here? I'm not, I'm not taking anything away from Jalen Brown. Mm -hmm. I love Jalen Brown. I think he's a great player. I think he made clutch shots. He struggled in the first half. Tatum had 31 last night, and this is the comments that we're talking about after the game. After you had 31. But, again, he didn't shoot a great percentage. So now you nitpick, and he made a great comment. I like Jason Tatum. He made a great comment. He says, you know what? A couple of years ago, we lost the championship, no matter how well I played. So now we're up 3-0. I scored a lot. Now, we're again, I'm scoring not as great as I did before. And we're up 3-0, and people are still questioning what? I'm not what? A, a go-to guy? I'm not the guy? They're up 3-0. They're going to the championship. So, again, when people do that, that's what frustrates athletes, right? Oh, you want me to shoot every time, and if I score a lot and we lose, you say I'm not a team player, right? Then I'm, I'm guarding a big. I'm getting assists. I'm getting rebounds. Okay, I'm not shooting as great, but I still get 31, and I'm at the podium asking this question. We're up 3-0. Think about what's going through that man's head. It's, it's really, this kind of conversation of whose team it is has always kind of left me cold because, Chris, to your point, this team, the Celtics team, is not really built for just having one guy who's the centerpiece. One through six have all been excellent. And it's okay if, Jay, uh, if uh, Jason Tatum isn't scoring the ball super efficiently because he does do all these other things, and they are winning. And by the way, after they win this 18th championship and they have the stupid duck boat parade down the Charles River – and they and then he gets a super max contract this off season, and then he goes and plays on Team USA and probably wins a gold medal. Nobody's gonna remember this. Nobody's gonna go, hey, whose team is that again? They're just gonna go, man, he's on an amazing run. So good for and, Jason and Tatum. Say, I think he's he's handled it really well. God. And, and, and let me just say this, John. When when LeBron James averaged like you know a triple double for the NBA Finals, you know who won the NBA MVP that year? Andre Iguodala. Yeah. So what I'm saying is when they give. When they when, when they when they talk about these awards, we're talking about the Celtics and Joe Mazzulla will talk about it, made a great point. There is no Batman. There is no Robin. There's Spider-Man in the Spider-Verse. It Drew Holiday had a great game. The game for it depends oh, on whose night it is. That's why this team is the team that they are and not the team that lost to the Heat last year. Yeah, they're a really good team. Uh, we're going to take a break and talk about the other team. We're going to talk about especially specifically two guys, SVGs and Ashley's favorite backcourt of all time Kyrie and Luca we got to got to get into those two guys and what has you happened with it. them in the series we're going to do that on the other side this is beyond the arc and you're watching CBS Sports Network Welcome back to Beyond the Arc. John, Ashley, and Chris Walker in today for Bill Ryder, who's out until tomorrow. Uh, you're watching us on CBS Sports Network. We're also a podcast. Find us wherever you get your favorite shows. Please download, subscribe, leave us a review if you would be so kind. Uh, we got to talk about the Dallas Mavericks because this has been a weird series for them. They haven't cracked 100 points. Look, Boston's defense is absolutely unbelievable, but they have the they have the best player in the series in Luka Doncic, even though last night he wasn't the best player. I just would have expected them to crack 100 at some point. They haven't done that. But Luka last night did not cover himself in glory. I want to start there before we get to Kyrie because Ashley pred predicted a good Kyrie game. and We finally got it. It just wasn't enough. But Luka goes for 27, 6, and 6. But his defense in this series has been atrocious. And last night it was crippling 
to the Dallas Mavericks. He fouls out on a Jalen Brown drive. Now, Jalen initiated most of the contact, but there's four minutes left, and he fouls out for just the third time in his career, first time in regulation. And we, you want to talk about Chris and Ashley, the moment that you knew the series was over, we rattled off a bunch of them. That's the moment that the series was over. The minute that he fouled out, book your, pl- your flights to Cancun, you're going home. But he had something to say about this after the game, and it was super typical of Luca. Here it is. I don't know. Uh, we couldn't play physical, so uh, I don't know. I don't want to say nothing, but, uh, you know, six foul in the NBA Finals, uh, where I basically I'm like this. Uh, come on, man. Better than that. So, Ash, he's basically pointing fingers saying, come on, man, the ref's got to be better. It's, look, it's hard to foul out Luka Doncic in a critical game three when you know the back's against the wall and he's the best player. But it was a foul by the letter of the law, and they could have called nine fouls on him last night, and he's complaining to the refs. Yeah, I mean, he took the bait. Uh, Jalen Brown set him up, and he took the bait. But it's not even... My dad is not a huge Luka fan, and I like Luka a lot, and we were having a conversation watching this game last night. And I have to say, I said this on HQ yesterday, that was one of the, if not the most, frustrating, disappointing, and just overall selfish finals appearance I have ever seen from a superstar caliber player. I mean, when we talk about Luka, we're talking about him in the same conversation sometimes as Michael Jordan, based on what he's able to do, at least offensively. And his commitment or lack thereof to defense is just so egregious and so disrespectful to the game, but to his teammates specifically. I mean, you have a vintage Kyrie Irving performance last night, a performance that you have been craving if you are rooting for the Dallas Mavericks. 35 points from him. At times, he looked absolutely unstoppable, Kyrie that is. And you have Luka just because he is he has such a huge bullseye on his back because when it comes to guarding him he is just so much he's he's food basically defensively it's just unbelievable but it's not even so much that he's not the best defensive player because that not everyone's going to be the creme la creme when it comes to defense right you have tiers of players who are better defensively than others it's his lack of commitment and his lack of effort and also it's his constant need to argue with the referees to the point that he's not even getting back in transition with his team to help them defensively. It is such a juvenile way to approach the game of basketball. It is a detrimental way to approach the game of basketball. It is something you see in AAU, in middle school, in high school sports. He's 25 years old. He needs an entire personality check redo whatever because the way that he approaches the game defensively and his constant need to argue with the referees is so detrimental to his team and he will never win a championship the way that he plays it's bad Ash went zero to a hundred real quick. I thought you were a Luka Doncic fan. I said, I started this <laughs> off as I am a Luka fan. My dad is not, but I am also a defense I girl. Where, I am a defense I girl. You, that is unacceptable. I'm sorry. I see why you cheer for the Cowboys. Shout out to your dad. Because you do that's, too. That's from his heart <laughs> that he talks about Luka the way he does. Because at the end of the day, for me, when I hear people, I cringe. I just left the NBA players camp and another camp called the Pangos, tons of NBA executives, and we fight and argue about who's the GOAT. And when they put Luka in the same breath as LeBron, I'm done with the conversation. I said, guys, give me a break. Let's talk about, you know, Love Boat. Let's talk about another show. Let's talk about (laughs) I'm done talking. Okay? We're not having that conversation. But here's the deal. Yeah, I was trying to date myself. (laughs) But here's the deal. Uh, when it comes to Luca and what happened last night, a smart coach knows if you if you devise a game plan to go at the best player, that's what you should do. Who's devoid of playing great defense, and that's what they did. Who's Luca gonna guard? Luca's always a guy looking for the mismatch. Guess what? On defense, he's the mismatch. He's a guy that can't play defense, and they go at him, and you get him out of the game, and they're a completely different game. You're right, Ashley. He whines far too much. Most great players do, but, and here's the other thing. He put so much pressure on you. And I've said this and I argue with my friends. I said, here's the game plan from the Celtics to let him shoot every single time 
tire himself out because it takes a lot to dribble, 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 back down, back down, score every time, not allow him to get everyone else into the game. He's exhausted, so he can't. The little defense that he may be able to play, he's not going to do it. And the Celtics are smart to play him the way they're playing him. And listen, as I said before, the Mavericks weren't supposed to be the team that faced him. Shout out to Nico Harrison, a friend, did a good job of bringing in P.J. Washington and Daniel Gafford. But let's face it, they came from teams that weren't winning. The bottom line is the best team is the Celtics for a reason. you got two great players in Kyrie and, and Luka Doncic. But at the end of the day, neither one are great defenders. So those guys were supposed to be the guy like Daniel and Lively as well to defend and help them. But they're not enough against this team. And if we're talking about Luka playing defense, it's a losing proposition. So when the Mavericks beat the tender pup, the Timber Puppies, I knew this was going to happen. I just didn't think it was going to be a sweep. I didn't think it was going to be a sweep either. I mean, honestly, like, you know, earlier in this uh, in the playoffs, at least Luka was giving some effort. And Kyrie, too. Kyrie, to his credit, was actually trying on defense in the first few series. I don't think he was the problem last night. I don't think he's, you know, offensively, he hasn't really been there until last night. But, Ash, you predicted a big Kyrie game. We got it last night, 35 mm -hmm. points. He actually made some threes. He had been 0 of 8 in the first two games. He went 4 of 6 from 3. He's now 0 for 13, though, against the Boston Celtics. And, like, that, that to me, if you had said to me before the game that Kyrie Irving was going to show up, that they were going to get out to a 13-point lead in the, in the third quarter, and absent Kristaps Porzingis, that the Dallas Mavericks were going to dominate the points in the paint, I would have said to you, oh, the Mavs won the game. Mm -hmm. But they didn't because... It wasn't enough. Nothing is enough for this team. That's how good Boston has been. It's just such a bummer that we finally got a Kyrie game and it wasn't yeah. enough. They couldn't even crack 100. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely disappointing. But I got to go back to something that Chris keeps saying because I disagree with this, that this isn't, isn't the team that was supposed to be here. Yes, nobody predicted the Mavs to be in the finals. I think that's fair to say, right? I think most people, um, unless everyone's you know different on this, I think most people would have assumed it'd be the Denver Nuggets looking to repeat and go ahead and defend their title as the reigning champs, right? But we're not talking about a Dallas Maverick team that went through an injured Clippers team or an injured Timberwolves team. We're talking about a Dallas Mavericks team that scratched and clawed their way out of every single series that they were in. This is not the Celtics where, again, I think everyone had the Celtics in the finals, but just talking about their path specifically, they went through a relatively easy path to get to the finals. Like, that's not to say that the prediction of them being in the finals is a fluke. It's not. But I don't think it's fair to what the Mavs were able to do after the All-Star break, how they figured out, at least in a moment in time, their defensive scheme with Daniel Gafford and, and got Luka and Kyrie, even if it was for a moment in time, to commit on defense. And offensively, Luka and Kyrie figured each other out. I don't know if it's fair to say that this team wasn't supposed to be here or this isn't a team that was supposed to be here, rather. They fought their way to this position. It's just that they're going against a Celtics team that is drastically better than them, and they're not even competing to the best of their ability but the Mavericks fought their way to this spot Chris so that's not fair well okay I don't know where fair is okay <laughs> fair that's the opposite I'm just term saying it's use. not fair <laughs> but let's not let's not tear let's not build up a month another man by tearing another man down the Celtics <laughs> have no control over who was on the other side of the of course ledger no, no of course injured. I agree with that but it would not have mattered because they were the best team in the NBA even if guys were healthy it would not have mattered so to say it was easier for the Celtics because guess what the, the Mavs have their chance to prove it right now and no, we're I agree. seeing who who the far superior team is. And again, the others, I talk about connectivity, the six of the Celtics, the guy you brought in, again, you're talking about Lively. I remember the last series, everyone was saying, oh my God, Daniel Lively. Oh my like, gosh, let's, let's stop this. Basketball people, if your big two aren't playing well, I don't care who Derek Lively or whoever it is, he ain't winning. Stop that. I get it, you want narratives, but if Luke doesn't play well and Kyrie doesn't play well, cancel Christmas. Cancun, here you come. Of course. The bottom line is if Tatum and Brown get 31 and Drew Holiday and Derek White do what they're supposed to do and Al Horford's playing defense the way he is and just being a great teammate 
and they stay ready, guys. Stay ready. Nobody in the NBA is beating this team. Doesn't matter what. Yeah, but that's different. Is. That's different than saying the Mavs shouldn't be here. They fought their way to this position. Whether I mean, or not listen. they're outmatched is a different conversation. I agree with you. They are outmatched. And when you talk about the Celtics' path, to your point, and I agree with you here, it's not their fault they went through an injured Eastern Conference. And again, it wouldn't have mattered. They probably would have been back in the finals regardless. But the Mavericks definitely deserve to be in this position. They fought their way to this position. Okay, they played the tender puppies who end up beating the they Nuggets. They beat the Clippers no also. That. No one expected that. And listen, the, the Shane Gilders Alexander, I mean, the number one seed, no one is, again, I'm going to say it again. I love the Mavericks. They made great trades. They played great down the stretch. But at the end of the day, they were outmatched from day one. And you know that, Ash. They did, they did a great job of fighting, their, their, their fighting themselves into the championship. But this is much to do about nothing. We're seeing the dominance of the Celtics. Of course. Who, by the way, struggled against teams that had injuries in the Eastern Conference. They had to come back against the Pacers in the fourth quarter every time. They haven't had this That's situation. That's one before. series, Chris. They did not struggle against any other team in the Eastern Conference. Stop listen, it. That, they listen, just fell asleep behind the wheel. Is, <laughs> listen, I know you got stock in American Airlines Arena or Mark Cuban. You probably got him on speed dial. I have no idea why you're trying to hype up and you love Kyrie. But at the I end do. of the day, <laughs> this is a, this series is over. over yeah, over I agree. Day. It's over. Period. And because the other team is far better and your superstar to the last hit before is a whiner. I like Luca. And everyone says, you don't like Luca. Talented player. Is he a winner, though? In, in this league, like in this league, is he a winner? And he has Kyrie, thank goodness. Right? I'm still mad at the Lakers for that, not pulling that trigger. But thank goodness Kyrie played good, because if not, it would be ugly. Hey, it's still it's still a win for the Mavs, though. I mean, this is a season that nobody expected them to have. So I, I think they ran into to what you were saying, Chris, the best team in the NBA. They are. And and they're for so many different reasons, the best team in the NBA, because they can beat you with so many different uh, people in, in so many different ways. And also, you had mentioned, Chris, the narrative and how the narrative is changing. And we all like narratives. I want, I'm interested to see what you guys think about the narrative surrounding Joe Missoula, because initially, especially on this show, we were super out on Joe. And now Ashley and Chris, yesterday, uh, Bill and I were talking about Joe. I might kind of be in on Joe Missoula. We're going to talk about him and his quirkiness after we take a break. That's coming. Ashley's making a face about this. I'm going to try to sell you on him, Ash. Uh, we're going to talk about that on Beyond the Arts. This is the CBS Sports Network. <laughs> All right, welcome back to Beyond the Arc. John, Ashley, and Chris hanging out on a Thursday. Uh, Joe Mazzulla, he's a, let's just call him a unique human being. We've discussed him and his quirkiness on this program many times. There, there's the stories about how he rewatched uh, The Town. I don't know if he still does, but he was watching The Town, the movie The Town, like three or four times a week. Uh, he sits, when he goes to a restaurant, he sits with his back to the wall so he can watch the door. He doesn't go through a ro That's revolving not weird. doors. That's not some people find it weird. I'm I'm among those. He doesn't he doesn't go through revolving doors because he's afraid that like that's a uh, like a moment when he could get uh, he could get got. Uh, uh, he had a beautiful mind answer the other day where he like recalled the sequence in game two that was absolutely ridiculous. Bill and I talked about that on yesterday's pod. It really blew me away. Prior to game three, he talked about another thing. Evidently, as like a motivational tactic, he gets his guys together and he shows them. UFC clips as a cautionary tale. Here's Joe Mazzulla. Yeah, like if you've ever been into a fight with someone and you think you're about to beat them, you usually get sucker punched. And so the closer you are to thinking you're going to beat them up, the closer you are to losing. Chris, going to come to you first on this. Tatum was talking about it afterwards. He's like, yeah, show us videos of guys getting choked out and like, you know, it really <laughs> motivates us to like not get metaphorically choked out. What do you make of... Missoula's coaching tactics because he's very unique. He is unique, and, and that takes a little bit of that. But it's interesting, Joe Missoula's been very disrespected in my mind. I mean, yeah. think about it. He's the coach of the best team in the best league in the world, and people are thinking that he doesn't deserve the job, and he's one win away from winning the championship. 
because he's young, because he Bill Belichick-esque, the way he talks to the media, the way he thinks about basketball outside of the boundaries of the what normal people think about shooting threes and, and the way he, you know, uh, uh, watches the town or any other show. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you this. Uh, when it comes to coaching and doing the job this man has done, and even the UFC clips, I always feel like Ashley wants to choke me sometimes when she makes some of those takes <laughs> come back at her real strong. And she has a tough time handling. That's okay, Ashley. It's okay. I get it. It's I get true. that all the time. But at the end of the day, you know what? Everyone has a different way of doing it, right? There's different ways to skin a cat. He has his way. Phil Jackson had his way, giving players books. He had to coach the ultimate superstars. And I just think that when he took over for Ime Yudoka, Brad Stevens and Danny Ainge made an unbelievable gamble on this young man. And it has paid dividends. And you got to be a little bit different. I'm not saying he's a genius, but most people who are simply super smart, guys like myself, John, I'm going to throw that out there. <laughs> John, you know what I'm saying? You think outside the box, we're not in it. You can't corner us. You can't square a circle. And this dude has done a great job of, you know what he's done a great job of? Staying out of the way. That's what he's done a great job of. And you take this team and you and you look at it, and no matter what anyone says, and the best thing they did was they brought in Drew Holiday, and even Jason Tatum says, I don't even know how they let let him let us get him, which is true. What were they thinking in Milwaukee? That certainly didn't work out well. But Drew Holiday has been the glue, but the two superstars have been great. And Joe Mazzul, I thought, again, I think has been very disrespected. And I listen, I champion guys like him that move slow. Move in silence, as the rappers say. But at the end of the day, look what he's doing right now with a thunderous war whooping up on Ashley's Mavericks. I mean, to your point, it shouldn't take much to whoop on them because they shouldn't be here in the first place. So what exactly is Joe Mazzulla doing that's so grand? He's winning the championship, a guy who they thought, again, we're talking about, this. My, think about this, and I'll let Ashley go. Danny Hurley won two championships at Connecticut. Very hard to do back-to-back. -back. Mm -hmm. The Lakers are talking about him. Joe Mazzulla never did anything. And they make him, again, the Celtics, who everyone says an overwhelming favorite. Everyone says he shouldn't get the job. You got mm -hmm. Kendrick Perkins, and he's a, put his a brain in a bird and a fly backwards. Just disrespect of what it takes to be in that locker room. And guys say things like that. I've been a coach for over 20 years. Again, I play, and I say that is so disrespectful because the players that wear that green uniform, they know. And it's not just about X's and O's, right? It's also about cultivating a great uh, uh, camaraderie between those guys, knowing when to push buttons. It's not that easy. And again, we saw what happened last year. Mm -hmm. Maybe they learned some lessons, throw Drew Holiday there. The bottom line is it's getting done this year. And the question is, are the retractions going to be written on the back page or the front page? I um so I like Joe Mazzulla as a personality. I think that I find his quirkiness endearing. Um, I like the bar that he dropped. You guys weren't big fans of the bar when I dropped it, where he says unless they change the light bulbs in the arena, it's not going to be any brighter or something like that. I thought that was funny. Um, I find him humorous. I find him quirky. I like people like that. You know, it's just different. So I like him as a individual. When we're talking about him as a coach. Um, I was definitely more on the apprehensive side about him as he got deeper into the playoffs, If he, depending on the matchup. Now, I think he's a better coach than Jason Kidd is, at least in this particular series. But at least in this particular series, in this series. But here's the thing. I think there's tiers to coaches, right? And I bring this up often. There's Greg Popovich's. There's Phil Jackson's. You know, there's those type of coaches. I wouldn't say that Joe Mazzulla is an exceptional head coach. He has a immense amount of talent at his disposal. And sometimes when you have a drastically, severely talented team like he has in the Boston Celtics, it's not so much what you do, but it's what you don't do. And that is just screw it up. He doesn't have to come up with these elaborate game plans. He doesn't have to go ahead and tap into the deepest realms of his mind to make this team win. This is a team that, for all intents and purposes, outside of a few additions here or there over the course of a few seasons, this is a team that has played together. The chemistry, at least with your duo of Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown, has been there for seasons. You don't need to get them reacquainted. They know each other. They've been in the trenches figuring it out. Now, there's been moving pieces, like I said, around them, but it's not like you have to go ahead and do what Phil Jackson did and bring them on retreat so that they can go ahead and kumbaya and get to know each other. That's out of the way. They've been there. 
there's some time, and I'm not going to call Joe Mazzulla a game manager because that's disrespectful, but I feel like he's not doing anything that's overly just like wow mind blown he has a severely oh, he has a severely talented team i could go out there and coach those guys let's be honest he's they're stars. that good That's it. he's got two stars he's got two stars what exactly what is it that you need to go ahead and elaborately scheme up if you put me out there i know exactly knowing just the fundamentals of basketball i could get this team to win games they are that good that deep that lethal both on offense and defense, and this is not a knock to Joe Mazzula. I'm not knocking him. I think he has done a great job with this team. They were number one for a reason. But let's not make it seem like he's the second coming of Phil Jackson or Greg Popovich or even an Eric Spolstra. He's not in that tier of coach, and he doesn't have to be. They're that good. It is kind of a little chicken in the egg scenario, though, because the personnel kind of dictate how they play. But he did implement a five-out scheme where they're just shooting up more right. threes than anybody else. I mean, so it is a little bit of like, eh, is it him or is it the players? It's both, though. It can, two things can be true at the same time. He's having a really good season. They're having a good season. He's 35 years old. He's going to be the youngest coach to win a championship since Bill Russell. That's a nice plaque to hang mm -hmm. on your wall. Uh, all right, we're going to take a quick break. I know and he doesn't cool. have LeBron, Ashley, just so you know. And about he doesn't have LeBron. Doesn't. Um, <laughs> speaking of coaches, okay. by the way, I don't know if you guys have heard about this, but the Lakers are still looking for one. We're going to discuss how, don't call it a comeback, it looks like J.J. Redick is back in the driver's seat to land that gig. That's coming up on Beyond the Arc on CBS Sports Network. Welcome back to Beyond the Arc, John, Ashley, and Chris here. This has been a very fun show, guys. Uh, you should check us out on our YouTube page at Beyond the Arc CBS because some of these fun interactions that you have seen right here on CBS Sports Network, they're going to chop them up. You can see Ashley and Chris going at it again. Uh, go over there, check it out, subscribe, hit the like button. Le hit the like button on these two for sure and leave a comment as well. You can uh, decide who is right in the debate between Chris and Ashley about Joe Mazzulla being the new Eric Spolstra, which is really pretty fantastic. But speaking of uh, coaching searches, the Lakers are still looking for one. Dan Hurley, earlier this week, he passed on a six-year, $70 million deal. Well, now, according to Woj over at ESPN, J.J. Redick is back at the forefront. He is expected to formally interview for this position this weekend. He'll meet with Rob Palenka and owner Jeannie Buss. That's expected to move him to the front of the line. It seems, Ash, as you shake in your head about this, that it's going to be J.J., podcast partners in crime reunited. I just don't understand how J.J. has been the front runner, if you allow the reports to circulate before or penetrate your brain before Dan Hurley kind of came out of left field, right? You've been the front runner, I put that in air quotes, for weeks, and you haven't been formally interviewed yet? Like, come on, guys. Like, He's I, got the finals going on. So what? The finals aren't every single day. Pick a day that he's not working and interview the man. Like, I don't understand what the issue is. Like, I don't understand how you've been the front runner, allegedly, for weeks. Dan Hurley comes out of left field. Dan Hurley gets the offer, turns down the offer, and you still haven't even gotten an interview. Nobody finds that weird. Come on. It's just like make a decision, L.A., the draft's right around the corner. You don't have a head coach. Is it going to be J.J.? Is it going to be whoever else? At this point, like, we don't even care anymore. Just pick a head coach. It's just embarrassing. It's a free-for-all. Listen, it's Tinseltown. Ashley, dramas make the best movies. Clearly. I can't believe you don't see this Well, they're coming. not winning movies, apparently, so I guess. Well, well today, will, the Oscar will come next year, right? Right now, mm -hmm. we got to get a coach that can get in there, that get in sync with LeBron. We got to do, Rob Blink, here's the deal. Forget about the coach. Rob Blink got to do his job. We got to find some other pieces around those two superstars. That's where it starts. Being in sync with LeBron, being in sync with AD is the most important thing, in my opinion. They played the most games together. They played probably since they've been with L.A. And again, the other pieces around them, the Vanderbilts, all the bad signees, Gabe Vincent, just terrible. Rui, uh, I mean, I'm just saying at the end of the day, this me, it's more about the front offers than it is the head coach. Because someone on the other end of this ledger said, being the head coach doesn't matter. So let's just put anybody there then. So if you can put Joe Mazzulla with the Celtics, then we certainly could put J.J. Redick with the greatest player of all time and A.D. That's your problem. 
And that Period. is why you're searching for your, what, fifth head coach in 10 seasons, Chris? Because that is the mentality in L.A., and that is why you guys have yet to succeed since the in-season tournament, if you want to count that, or the bubble I mean, chip, the bubble if you want to count the, the bubble. bubble championship. Sorry, I forgot well, about that one. You guys, yeah, didn't, you guys didn't have a parade for that. It kind of passed my memory. But it's just like, come on now. Seriously, like, that's, is that is that what we're doing? No, I'm kind what, of surprised. what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is at the end of the day, the bottom line is they finished no better than seventh in the last, what, 12 years? And what it comes down to me is that they need to get someone that's more in sync. I like Darvin Ham. I didn't love him. No disrespect to him. We all know, no matter what, as long as number 23 is out there, it's his team, period. You've got to either Clearly. trade him, which I'm an advocate for, trading him and then letting J.J. start over or get somebody that's going to be in sync with him so now they can – finish in the playoffs because remember Ashley you talk about this team they did play in the Western Conference Finals last year they okay did. miracles it, happen it, every day Chris it kind oh. of surprises me like how far the Lakers have fallen in in terms of perception right because Dan Hurley is a look he's built a great program at UConn and he's going for his third straight national championship but it's still Connecticut and we're talking about the Los Angeles Lakers here in Los Angeles and I just am kind of blown away that they didn't throw more money at him and get him to come and that he would rather live in stores, Connecticut than Los Angeles, California. We talked about this earlier in the week, Ashley, and I, I said I'd report back to you on Connecticut. I've been up here before. I lived in Boston for a while. Connecticut's perfectly fine. But Connecticut is, you know how there's flyover states? Connecticut is a drive-through state. You drive to Boston or you go down to New York. Nobody ever goes, you know what I'm doing this weekend? I'm going to Connecticut. People here are getting out of Connecticut to go somewhere else. So it kind of blows me away that the Lakers couldn't convince Dan Hurley to go there. And I think that speaks volumes about that job, that organization, how people feel about it. Why them. would they? Why would he? He has, he, has a chance, he has a chance to three-peat. He also has a chance to really help mold and develop players. He's not going to do that in L.A., especially. I don't care what LeBron says. He's not somebody that you coach. You collaborate with LeBron. We know that. Wow. The expectations of the Lakers are to win a championship. They're not winning a championship anytime soon. They're not built for it. They're in their mind. They think that they're better than they are, but they are not winning another chip in the Western Conference as currently constructed. They put unrealistic expectations on any head coach that is in that position and the immediate reaction to them not meeting those expectations like oh we got to get rid of them we got to find somebody else like come on nobody yes, wants that job yes. nobody yes, wants that job yes, this is, is well like. JJ wants that job evidently and JJ is going to get that job and by the way it's great for us because it's going to make tremendous content please please let those two guys continue to do their podcast no while way. JJ is <laughs> coach it would be absolutely unbelievable all right, uh, one more quick break, and then Beyond the Arc rolls on right here on CBS Sports Network. Please. You guys are brutal. Welcome back to Beyond the Arc, wrapping up the show on a Thursday. This has been a spirited conversation. <laughs> I have enjoyed it quite a bit. Uh, Ash, final thoughts for today? I can't wait till next NBA season. Chris, come down with your boxing gloves. I'm ready for you. Listen, all I got to say is Joe Mazzulla is a good coach, and I got to give a shout-out to Jerry West. I did know him, the kindest Hall of Famer to ever live. Oh. Yeah, rest in peace. Ah, see, you, you guys made up on you. reached the court. Uh, rest in peace, Jerry <laughs> I West. Had to, I had to. You know how it is. She's nice a cowboy fan. I had to. That's a great way to end the show on a positive note. Enjoyed it with both of you. For now, though, that's it for us. We're going to be back at it tomorrow on CBS Sports Network at 2 p.m. Eastern. Bill will be back. Uh, Chris, thank you so much for filling in. Ashley, Ashley will be here as well. I'll be here. We will see you guys tomorrow. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in to Beyond the Arc.